Hi everyone, and thank you for joining me. Uh, today we're going to talk about the PG and IC designs, both corner lens designs and their application, particularly for the irregular cornea. Before we do that, though, I just want to talk about why different designs are needed for different corneal shapes. If you have cones, as you see here on the left, typically the steepest part is the apex of the cone, which is central or paracentral which means that every curve outside of that gets flatter and flatter. So the steepest curve is centrally, but that's not the case with these conditions, particularly post-operative conditions such as laser or graft, where often the flattest part of the cornea is central, and then we have the steepest part just outside that, and then you flatten off in the periphery, which requires a completely different mindset as to how you fit it. Do remember that for all these conditions, you can use Excel design because it vaults over the, the cornea. It doesn't really matter what shape you're fitting. Uh, mm -hmm. It's independent of that. So Excel can be used on any of those conditions. To explain this a little bit more about design, keratoconus is a very good example. If you try to use a normal lens with a large back optic zone on keratoconus, you get away with it for early cones, as you can see here. Well, you end up with a shallow pool and you get enough tear exchange to be fine. But if you try to fit a large back optic zone on a steep keratoconic, you end up with these very, very deep pools here and you end up with very tight zones here. So what you have to do to compensate for that is to make the optic area smaller and then put lots more fitting curves out here. So your secondary curves become wider than they do in this example here. How does that affect the fluorescent pattern? This is a normal uh, lens uh, here. That's the optic zone here. So it occupies most of the back surface. If you try to put it on a keratoconic, this is what you end up with. There's the edge of the optic zone here and here. So you end up with pulling and you end up with a very tight periphery. If you go to a smaller back optic, this is what you end up with. And this is a, a Rose K2 keratoconus lens on a cone. And you can see here the optic zone is smaller, the pulling becomes smaller, the fitting area becomes wider, and then you have a nice edge lift. This is gonna work, this is not going to work. So design is very important when you're thinking about the condition you're fitting. So today we're gonna to mainly talk about um, the post graft in post-surgical corneas, or they will touch on a, a couple of other areas. So what types of corneal surgery do we have? We have grafts and they can be full penetrating grafts or they can be partial penetrating grafts. We have laser or PRK, radial uh, keratotomy and corneal ring inserts. Those are our four main categories uh, that we see in, in corneal surgery. But this commonly results, all these, in a slightly flat oblate central zone. Very, very rarely do you end up uh, with a prolate central area, it's usually oblate after surgery. And if you try to fit an oblate cornea with a regular design corneal lens, here's the edge of the graft here, you end up with fitting it on the highest part of the graft, around the edge of the graft, and often with a pull here, which you can get bubbles and it becomes poor vision, and the deeper this tear layer, the poorer the vision is. Not ideal. So what we do with the PG and IC designs is we introduce, to stop this deep pull here, we introduce a very, very flat central curve, as you can see here, and then we put a reverse geometry curve in, which is steeper than our central curve, to give us the sagittal height that we need to fit this cornea. And then we flatten it out uh, in the peripheral curves. So what is the PG design? It has reverse geometry at any basis flatter than 7.4. Once you get steeper than that, typically you're getting to a normal shaped cornea, and therefore you don't need reverse geometry. So you get increased amount of reverse geometry as the base curve flattens. So a 9.0 base curve has much more reverse geometry than a 7.4. A large back optic zone, which covers the entire graph, so it's usually over eight millimeters, Deeper peripheral curves in the keratoconus lens, you don't need to flatten out the periphery as fast. A larger diameter than the keratoconus lens as well, with the standard diameter being around 10.4 for the trial set. So corneal grafts do 
cause us, I think, are probably the most difficult of all fits to, to fit. So they often have a regular corneal profile, which means that no two graphs are the same, with high degrees of astigmatism, which is often irregular, as you can see here. They can be proud, tilted, sunken, or oblate or prolate. And often the highest part of the graph is along the suture line, which makes it quite difficult sometimes to get a lens to center. The centration of the graft is important. Not always does the surgeon get it exactly right over the pupil. And always take a look and consider the age and the type of graft. There is a, a school of thought out there that fitting uh, semi-scleral lenses uh, that vault the cornea is not particularly good on old grafts with very low endothelial counts. So do make sure you have a good look at the endothelium. Uh, if it's an old graft, make sure that you think this graft will take uh, a semi-scleral lens. If not, try corneal lens always first. So fit is invariably compromised. Don't expect to get a perfect fit. You never will. Do also remember that don't refer cases, like keratoconic places off for grafts unless it's absolutely necessary. Try everything you can. And these three studies done several years ago now, um, these are patients that were referred to a ophthalmologist for grafts. The ophthalmologist sent them back to expert fitters and said, you don't need grafts. And 85% achieved a successful outcome um, you know, with a 20-30 vision. So the fit is invariably, as I said, is a compromise. So don't expect a perfect fit. So post-graft, uh, primary indications for this lens, post-graft, post-lasic, and post-corneal rings, with secondary indication being large descent oval cones. And we'll go into that in a moment. The trial set's quite extensive, 22 lenses with a, a range of, a significant range of base curves, but also it goes outside that range and you can go both steeper and flatter than the trial set range. Standard diameter is 10.4, but you have a large range of diameters as small as 9, 4 to 12. And you have five standard edge lifts, which is what I used when I originally designed the PG lens. For, you, for those that use my fitting system or any of my designs, you'll know this is what I advocate, uh, the five-step fitting system, starting with the central fit, peripheral fit, time to location, lens movement. This is the order that we approach the fitting in, and that applies to the PG design as well. So let's start with the central fit or the base curve. There is a fit practitioner's fitting guide, which will give you for the post-graft lens uh, a a hint or an idea of what the first lens you should try. So it's 0.3 steeper than the average K reading. So you can see here that applies for post graft and for post leads. So for post corneal for corneal rings, we ask you to refer to the keratoconus guide because actually when you put a corneal ring in, it only flattens the cornea about 0.1 to 0.2. Uh, it's quite interesting. You don't get a large flattening. You just get more regular shape over that area of cornea. So looking at the fluorescent patterns for the central fitting client, we ignore the peripheral fit at the stage. We're just going to be looking what's happening over that central fit. You can evaluate it as soon as you put the lens on it and then change lenses immediately, whether it's too flat or too steep. Always evaluate the fit over the highest point. Not That may not necessarily be central, remember, with graphs it's often along the edge of the graph. So when you're assessing the highest point, you're not looking here, you're looking here or here. And you're trying to achieve a very light feather touch, as you see in this pattern here. This is acceptable. You might say it's a little bit too much touch there, but overall, if I steepen this, I'm going to also make this steeper, which I don't want to do. So if this patient was wearing this lens happily, I would not change it. Both these show steep central fits. I need to go flatter. And both these show significantly flat fits over that central cornea and also here over the edge of the graft here. But this patient came in wearing this lens and although I think we could improve it, they were very happy. The cornea was very happy. Uh, what do I think of it? it? I'll just go, sorry, I'll just go back to that. It's a little bit flat here. With the lid pressing down on that, it's causing the bottom of the lens to lift off a little. 
So we're not getting bubbles. We're getting very good tear exchange. Uh, the edge is a little bit wide, but overall the patient was happy. So the cornea was happy. We're getting good vision. I didn't change it at all. Here's one where you can see the, here's the edge of the graft here. We've got a high spot here and here. So we've got a lot of against the rule astigmatism. We've got a, a channel through here and touch here and here. Now you can say, is that a satisfactory fit? Well, in fact, this patient was wearing this lens quite happily. And the main reason why it was the tericity was only over the graft. It didn't extend out into the peripheral cornea. And therefore the lens sat very well on that peripheral cornea. And it didn't matter that it didn't fit perfectly over that central area. So uh, we've got a definitely a toric against the rule pattern. Edge lift is fine. Good centration, good diameter, and no obvious corneal staining. I wouldn't change that fit. Here's another one we've got against the rule uh, corneal graft. Here, you're going to have to do something because the lens is not locating correctly. It's tending to push out. So we need to do something to try to overcome that. And we could use here a toric periphery. Now, a toric periphery means that from about here to here, so that central part of the lens remains spherical, but the last millimeter or so becomes toric. And in this case, I would revert to a toric periphery as my first option. If that didn't work, you can go to a fallback surface toric. Here's a fit over corneal rings, excellent result, lovely edge lift. Main thing with corneal lens, do not ever leave it flat over the highest part. That's usually where the ring has been inserted. Make sure you clear that area, otherwise you'll get staining over that area. Let's move on to the peripheral fit. When we're talking about the peripheral fit, we're talking about what happens uh, from the edge of the optic zone out to the edge of the lens. When you change the edge lift from any of my designs, all those secondary curves will change. Although when we're judging the fit, we're only judging the last about one millimeter. We don't often look closer in on this. So initially I defined five lifts. Then I was asked to extend that. So I put intermediate lifts between it. These, so you can have 1.5, 0.5, etc. here. So minus means we're tightening the lift. Plus means we're increasing the lift. However, that wasn't enough for fitters. And I've had to extend that from actually minus three decreased to plus seven increased, which gives you 19 edge lift options in total in, in 0.5 steps. So you should be able to find some edge lift to match the corneal peripheral cornea. So what we're looking for, this is an absolute ideal edge lift, uh, a nice, uh, this is about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 millimeters wide here. Uh, absolutely ideal, I'd be very, very happy uh, with that edge lift. Even though we're standing off a bit here, we're not getting bubbles. I'm not one to worry about it. If I'm not getting bubbling, it's not causing problems, then I would leave that exactly the way it was. This one here, this is getting excessive. This is getting over a millimeter. This would make the lens a lot more mobile, and you can see it is tending to actually mislocate uh, out into the temporal portion here. So here you'd want to order a decreased lift. Both these are too tight in the periphery. If you see that black edge that you can see here, see it again here well, this indicate the edge lift is too tight. You would need to increase it. And the standard plus one would, would give us a nice result here, resulting in an edge lift like you can see in this part of the lens here. Moving to diameter. The diameter uh, that you're trying to use for PG will give you at least 0.7 to 1 millimeters at the edge of the lens inside the limbus. So this is not a lens that goes right out and covers the entire cornea. So this is an ideal uh, diameter. This is an ideal diameter. We're still well clear of the limbus here. In both these two cases, we show large diameters where the lens is now impinging onto the limbus. And again here, impinging on the limbus. So both these are too big. Um, this is probably 11.2 or 11.4 millimeter lens. You'd need at least a millimeter less in your diameter here. So the rule of thumb is you try to use the minimum diameter 
that results in good centration movement and stability. Okay, and try to avoid it impacting into that limbal area. This is too small. You can see the edge of the graft here. The lens is actually just about within the graft. It's not much bigger than the graft. So this lens would be quite unstable. You'd need to increase the size of the lens very significant to make it fit further out over that graft edge. What about location? Sometimes location is very difficult to get because the lens wants to gravitate towards the highest point. And in this case here, the highest point is here. So we're getting some lateral um, decentration over this highest point. Here, not too bad, but again, uh, not locating too bad at all. So what we're trying to do again is locate it centrally over the pupil and not impinge on or cross the limbus. Going larger and steeper can sometimes help centration, uh, but not always. That, for example, going larger here is obviously not an option. Going steeper, yep, that's an option, and maybe going a fraction smaller there. Here you're looking, so this is not a bag fit with the patient looking straight ahead on this graft, but as soon as they look laterally, you can see that the lens shifts off the cornea onto the sclera. So this is not going to be particularly satisfactory particularly if the patient's looking behind them, for example, like backing a car, it would make it very difficult for them to keep that lens on the cornea. I mentioned that the post-graft lens is quite ideal in some cases of large low oval cones. Why? Here we have two cases where we have large descented oval cones. If I tried to fit a smaller diameter keratoconic lens on these, the lens would descend it down, and it would be very difficult for it to get it to sit up under the lid over the pupil. So this would cause discomfort, and it would also cause poorer vision. By going to a larger lens, which has a larger back optic zone, we can make sure the highest point in the cornea is still within the optic area without the lens having to decenter. So larger diameters like the PG are quite ideal for very descended cones like you see here. And finally, lens movement. We're looking for a lens movement about 1 to 1.5 millimeters of vertical movement with a blink, as you can see here. This is a quite ideal amount of movement. This will ensure we get tear exchange, which will keep that area under the cornea and the central cornea uh, quite refreshed with, with fresh tears. So to decrease the movement, you decrease the edge lift, steepen the bay curve, or make the lens bigger. To increase it, you do exactly the opposite. So here again is lens movement, which is ideal, and this is a post-graft front torque. So we've got 350 diopters at oblique axis. That little dot there indicates the base of the prism, and you can see how stable that is. The patient's blinking, we're not getting any rotation. This is an excellent fit. We've got slight feather touch here, which is what we want to achieve. And we've got a lovely looking peripheral fit. This would be a very successful lens. So just a couple of case histories before we move to the IC design. Uh, this was one here where no matter what I did, even with my post graph lens, I ended up with a fit like this needed to go steeper to get over this area, but that would make this worse. If I went flatter to, uh, to reduce that falling here, that would make the fit over this area. And you can see why we've got a very, very oblate shape in the center of the cornea. So what I decided to use, it was a plus 350 disposable lens underneath this lens to try to reduce that falling and to protect this area here. And this, as you can see, the edge of the soft lens is the result. Still lifting off a fraction inferiorly, but overall a much better looking fitting pattern, and we got an excellent result. So if all else fails, you don't want to go to a semi-scleral design, do think about piggybacking. And the power of the disposable lens you use is significant in changing the, the shit, what is happening to that central cornea. In fact, just yesterday here in uh, Auckland, uh, in New Zealand, I used a plus 650 in a case like this to give me a good central fit over a very, very oblate um, LASIK cornea. 
In some cases, uh, with these uh, corneas, you do get uh, little bubbles entering, dimple veiling, or the, as you can see here. If that bubbling does not interfere with the vision, as it really doesn't here, it may not be an issue at all. The reason why this is happening is the inferior part of the lens is lifting off. Bubbles are coming in through this area and breaking up. Uh, this is probably not going to cause visual problems, but if you want to make it better, you would need to close down this part of the lens with something we call ACT, asymmetric corneal technology, and we would close this part down so that we don't get bubbling underneath it. Here, what can we do uh, to improve the situation? You can flatten the base curve a little bit. It will help increase the edge lift, although this edge lift looks good. Increasing the edge lift will often get rid of the bubbles. Make it smaller. When you go smaller, you reduce the back optic area, which reduces the pulling. And you have that option of using ACT, as I showed you here, or quadrant-specific edge lifts, where you can dial up a different edge lift in any of four quadrants. Here's case history two. This is a post-graft uh, toric cornea fitted directly onto the graft. Here is what I fitted, 7165. The lens always located nasally, as you see here. I couldn't get it to sit centrally. So what I did is I piggybacked it over a plus 350 and immediately got a much better centration using just a toric periphery rather than a fallback surface toric on a graft. So what I learned by that was that fallback surface torics are not particularly useful on toric glass. Often they will not locate, particularly if the, the uh, astigmatism is, is oblique. I found that toric peripheries are more successful than fallback surface toric lenses, and using plus-powered lenses can help centration. And the third case history was a, a case where a woman uh, had very poor vision in one eye. She went on to play golf, and although her left eye was reasonable vision, the right eye had very poor vision. And no matter what lens we put it on, we couldn't get better than 618. So with a PG design directly onto the eye, we had a lot of pulling. This is an XL. You can see the edge of the lens here directly onto the eye. Again, even though we are flat here, we've still got very significant pulling over that central area of the cornea. So what I did was I decided to use a plus six disposable lens. And you can see here, immediately now we've got touch here and here. But a nice sitting pattern. What happened to the vision? It improved up to 6.9. So she uses this lens just for golf, and that's all she does. When she goes out to the golf course, she puts in this lens to give her excellent vision. So if you, there's a lot to take in there. We do have a fitting guide on rosekaylens.com. If you go to the uh, fitting guide here under the practitioner's section, you will find there's a section on PG, uh, which goes over what I've just explained. Okay, moving on to the IC design. It's a large, slightly larger ear, uh, cornea, and you notice that it occupies most of the cornea here. It's for larger areas of distortion. So its primary indications is early pellucid globus, like uh, laser induced ectasia, but also it's good for corneal grafts or large, very descended oval guys. So the design is very similar to the PG lens. The major difference is the, is the standard larger diameter of around 11.2 or 11.4 and slightly tighter peripheral curves. It has reverse geometry exactly the same as PG. And as I mentioned, it is about a millimeter bigger standard size than the PG lens. So it occupies most of the cornea. Again, we have a, a large range of edge lifts and 0.5 steps from minus three decreased to plus seven increased. I'm not gonna go through these one at a time, but I'm going to do for the IC lens, is just show you some patterns and make some comments on them, rather than go through each of these, which I explained quite clearly in the, in the PG design. So looking at what we're gonna consider here, central fit, where is this? This is a cone, there's the apex of the cone there, a very low cone. So they've gone to the IC design to stop the lens to centering down. This has resulted in a much bigger optic area. We've got quite a lot of pulling here, but 
very happy. This patient was extremely happy with the result. We have an excellent edge lift pattern there. It's exactly what I want to see, that nice fluorescent band, about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 millimeters wide. No points for this one, obviously too flat. That's not going to move all over the place. What is the main problem with this IC fit? Just give you a moment to look at that. The main problem is these two tight areas here and here. Sorry about that. So the main problem with this fit is these two tight areas here and here. So what we're going to have to do is increase that edge lift. But the edge lift here looks good. So how can we do it? When you have symmetry like you have here and here, toric periphery is your best option because you're not going to change the fit over that central cornea. All you're going to do is change the fit from here out to the edge of the lens, which is going to give you a very good result. You can use quadrant specific edge lifts as well, but here where you have symmetry, I would go to toric periphery to resolve or to improve that fit. What are the problems with this fit? Again, no point. The base curve is too flat and we have excessive edge lift. Do remember with all my designs, as you steepen the base curve, the edge lift will tighten. As you flatten the base curve, the edge lift will open up. So you can't really judge whether you have to change the edge lift until you have the correct base curve. What's the main problem with this fit? Again, the base curve is too flat. The lens is riding on here and it's causing it to lift off inferiorly. This patient was wearing this lens, this IC lens, quite happily. I didn't change it. Not an ideal fit. You can see we have got touch over that area here along the edge of the graft. But the patient was happy. I didn't bother to change it at all. Could I have gone slightly steeper? Maybe. Is the edge lift good here? Yes. It's not good here. Would I have used quadrant-specific edge lifts? But there was no problems. The patient was happy. I didn't go searching for problems. Here's an IC on keratoconus. Here's the cone. It's a relatively central cone. How could we improve the fit? Could we increase the edge lift? Yes, but it would also increase it here. What about a toric periphery? That's going to increase the edge lift here and here and shut it down here. That looks like a good option. ACT, only if we didn't have tight here and tight here would we bother about ACT or XL. So again here, a toric periphery with an increased edge lift would be my options here. Here's an IC on radial RK, um, difficult to fit, and sometimes it's very hard to stop standing over these scar tissues where we have the cuts. In general, IC can be used uh, as an option for RK, but I prefer to use XL, which vaults over most of this area and doesn't tend to rest on those high areas. Uh, this is IC on an oblique astigmatic graph. Again, not an ideal fit. You can see we've got touch here. We're getting a little bit of lift off in this area. How would you improve it? Could we use a toric periphery? I can't see what's happening up here, so I can't tell you. If we had the same pattern up here as we had here, I would use a toric periphery. Otherwise, I would think about using a, I'll play that video again, a quadrant specific edge lift where I'm going to make the edge lift higher in this quadrant here. I see on a post graph with a relaxing incision cut. Uh, what do you think of it? Base curve is a bit steep. Periphery is definitely tight. There's that little black band we talked about earlier. You see that, you know you've got to increase that. Diameter's good, location's good. So all you're going to have to go here is a little bit flatter, probably about 0.2 flatter centrally and uh, open up that periphery. I see on a very descended cone again, uh, would you use PG here? You may have got away with PG, but this practitioner has used the IC design. So the cone apex would bear in quite heavily if to make sure we didn't cause um, staining over that point. And in the periphery, the darker that band is, the more you have to change the edge lifts. So going to a standard increase is not going to be sufficient you would have to go to a double increase or a plus two increase to open that edge lift up significantly. 
Here's another, how can we eliminate this bubble? This is an IC lens. Could we flatten the base curve? Yes, maybe by 0.1, but doesn't look too bad. Probably go a little bit flatter. Could we increase the edge lift because it's definitely tight here and here and here? Yes, I think overall we could increase the edge lift. Or could we change the design? Maybe going to a different design like PG, which is a bit smaller, has a bit more lift in the periphery, may be better because I see, you can see the size of the optic zone that runs from here to here, has a very large back aspheric optic zone which is why we're getting this bubble here, trapped along the edge. That's where the, the edge of the graft is here. We've got this negative area here. Going to a smaller diameter and a slight a design with a little bit more lift, like PG, would be more suitable here. This is IC directly onto a, the eye. You can see it was descended. We piggybacked it over a plus one uh, disposable lens and got an excellent result. The patient was delighted with the outcome. They couldn't tolerate the lens here. They love the lens in this situation. So some fitting tips. I always like to try fitting within the lim limbus as a first option, and I use the highest DK materials I can. This is the scenario we do not want to see, and I have seen it in some semi typically in semi-scleral designs where you've sealed off the cornea, and these vessels can appear very quickly, exactly what we don't want. So. Fitting graphs, I always like to try a corneal lens first. That's not always successful, and you have to use to a larger lens. Uh, I would much rather use a corneal scleral like XL rather than a full scleral, which tends to seal off the cornea much more. I want to finish up the lecture with just a couple of little words of wisdom. Do have a look at the endothelium, because endothelium is so important to keep that cornea clear. So what's the average endothelial count per square millimeter for a normal, healthy cornea? It's around 2,000 to 3,200. But in graphs, you can get down under 1,000, and once you start getting down under about 700 per square millimeter, you start to get problems. So if we look at a couple of studies that were done, this one done in 2019 with penet penetrating keratoplasties, at baseline when the graph was done, we had a range, uh, average range of cell count around 2,400. After five years, that had dropped down to under just on 1,000. So there had been, in fact, a 56% loss of endothelial cells on that graft over five years. So important to have a look at the graft. How old is it? Is it going to tolerate a, a semi-scleral lens, or should I try first with a corneal lens? And here's another one on graphs. Another study that was done uh, for, uh, for 15 years after penetrating keratoplasty, they found the annual rate of endothelial cell loss was about 8% a year. And then uh, in the first three to five years, then it dropped down to around 4% thereafter, which meant in the first 10 years, you had a roughly 21% chance of graft failure because of endothelial loss. So, is it safe to reduce oxygen levels to these already compromised cornea with low endothelial counts? I put that to you, be very careful. Without going into this in detail, just to remind you, you do have advanced options for both PG and IC. Correct periphery, we have talked about quadrant specific edge lifts, where you can dial up a different edge lift in each quadrant, no problem. ACT, uh, where you tuck in or tuck out any edge of the lens, you can do that in two quadrants. Typically with corneal lens, you want to tuck in the bottom of the lens, front surface thorax, back surface thorax, and we do have a biofocal design available in IC and PG. So what are the most common reasons for failure? Incorrect lens design would be my one that I see more and more. Edge lift, not taking enough attention to the edge lift, ignoring corneal astigmatism when it's affecting the fit, reluctance to the vary the overall diameter from the trial set, and a reluctance to use larger semial scleral design when corneal lenses uh, just don't work. So I'm finishing up this one with a couple. I'm going right back to the start of this lecture and saying to you the importance of design. This was sent to me from a practitioner who had just bought the IC set. Terrible. And they said, what do I think of this fit? I went back and said, well, we can definitely improve it a lot. 
The diameter is too big. The base curve is obviously grossly steep and the edge lift is tight. I asked the practitioner to send me with a map. What did he have? He had a keratoconic uh, and he was using my largest IC design on a cone which was only slightly descended down. What he should have used was the K2 keratoconic design. He would have got a much, much better result. And again here, because the practitioner has used the wrong design, he's used the IC design. This is a shocking fitting lens. It's much too tight in the periphery. It's quite good over that central area. We've got light feather touch. You can see the size of the back optic zone, which is much too big because he had a nipple cone. So he's used the IC design, which has the largest back optic area, instead of using the NC design, which has the smallest back optic area. And finally, this one, this is a very early cone. If you look here, average of 8.15, a very early cone here. And you can see here, they decided because of the decentration to use the PG design. Okay, we might have slight apical touch here, not too bad out with the base curve, much too tight in the periphery. I would have stuck with the KC design in about a 10.4 diameter. I think it would have fitted this cone better than the PG design. So in summing up, thank you very much for your attention. I hope I haven't bored you too much and hope I've given you some better understanding of how to fit the IC and PG design in your practice. It's a picture of uh, where I have my beach house in New Zealand, very beautiful part of the North Island. So I do hope when COVID uh, behaves itself, you can visit my lovely country. Thank you very much.